But I think that what COVID will do is already doing is helping us to determine what is really essential in professions and in institutions. And as far as I'm concerned, if you go to college and you don't learn to think differently about yourself and about the world, it's a waste of time. Um, it's as simple as that. And so there are all sorts of things which college do, which is very nice, which is give you friends and let you play sports um, and uh, you know, gets, gets you away from home. Uh, um, but that's not a reason for, you know, for spending huge amounts of money in a society. Yeah. And if you're just going, this is the more controversial point, if you're just going to get a job, then the employers should be doing the education. Welcome to Cambridge Forum, coming to you live via Zoom. I'm Mary Stack, the director of Cambridge Forum, and today we are delighted to welcome back the very popular original thinker, author, and all-round whiz, Professor Howard Gardner. Famous for reimagining and redefining the definition of intelligence, Gardner debunked the primacy of IQ tests in favor of multiple intelligences back in the 80s in his book, Frames of Mind, which proved to be a game changer in the field of cognitive education. Today, his latest book, A Synthesizing Mind, is a memoir and an overview of his own evolution and it also covers five decades of his observations about the human mind. Gardner contends that there has never been a better time to develop a synthesizing mind and proposes ways to cultivate that capacity. Welcome, Howard. Thank Please you, Mary. Me. So, I'm gonna go out on a limb here. Uh, this expression, a synthesizing mind, is it not just another way of celebrating the Renaissance man, Howard? You know, the Leonardo da Vinci's who had competence and understanding of multiple fields. I think that's an interesting way to, to frame it. Um, having interest in lots of things is probably a necessary condition, but synthesizing means that you put it together and optimally you put it together in a way that's interesting and novel. Um, so, not to take anything away from Leonardo, um, but he's very different from someone like Charles Darwin, who um, spent 20 or 30 years doing research of his own, being in contact with the great scholars around the world, um, raising all kinds of animals, um, focusing on the uh, Galapagos Islands uh, uh, and the flora and fauna there and then put it together in a way which, as we all know, changed forever the way people think about uh, uh, what it means to be alive and what it means to be a member of a species. Um, so if I wanted to, I'd say the difference between being a dilettante and being a synthesizer. Um, however, um, synthesis ranges from uh, putting stuff together in a way that doesn't make sense to others to a competent textbook to a very original textbook, um, 50, 60 years ago, Paul Samuelson wrote a textbook in economics and afterwards all the textbooks were children of Samuelson. Um, and then the ultimate synthesizers, people like Darwin, actually changed the way we, we think about a, a huge terrain. Um, but you, you certainly need to start with wide curiosity. And in fact, something that I just have begun to think about um, as a result of this memoir are what are the early signs of someone who's going to be a synthesizer? Um, as a kid, I read um, encyclopedias. What a weird thing to do. <laughs> and yet uh, something was telling me that if I read the next uh, entry, I might learn something very interesting. Now, of course, uh, young people, anybody, people of any age can surf the net uh, and uh, you can discover all sorts of interesting things, but you can quickly get into some kind of a rut and just look at one sort of thing. So that wide curiosity, I think, is definitely an early marker for the synthesizing mind. Just going back to that point for a moment, I mean, I would have thought, even though he's brilliant, Darwin was very much a specialist rather than a generalist um, in terms of he never really, he saw the scope of the significance in the big picture. 
but he pretty much stayed in his field. I mean, would you say someone like Elon Musk is a, like a modern day um, synthesizer or no? Yeah, no, I think so. Um, I know much less about Musk than I do about uh, Darwin. Um, <laughs> but Musk is uh, interested in the range of technologies. He asks new questions. He doesn't uh, stick to earth. <laughs> he doesn't stick to the conventional wisdom. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't know enough about him to know to what extent um, he does the dreaming and other people do the work out the details or whether he can go from you know, a very fine grained issue to, to broad things. But I think uh, students of Darwin would say that he was remarkably broad. In fact, uh, Oxford is just putting out a, a whole book on, Oxford, uh, on Darwin as a psychologist, something which most of us have not thought about. Uh, mm, no, so I... let's put it this way. Um, I talk in the book about somebody who spent 40 years studying the retina. I think that's amazing. Um, it's the sort of thing I could never do. Darwin was studying the nature of life. Uh, that's a pretty big, that's a pretty good, pretty, pretty big topic. That's true. That's true. Um, so I like the fact that uh, you've been looking at this for five decades now, the field of what is intelligence and how do we define it and how many kinds of intelligences are there. And you yourself have expanded that definition, I think. Um, initially, you had musical, bodily, kinesthetic, social, and then the self-reflection as the four forms of intelligence. And then you added existential thinking, naturalist appreciation, and this teaching capability. So is this something that you're discovering more about or, or are we changing or, or are, we all, are we just changing how we perceive intelligence? Well, those are two different, different questions. Um, I think that uh, actually the second question is the more important one for me. And that is rather than assuming because there's a single word intelligence, we just have one computer in here. And if it works well, we're smart, presumably in everything. If it works average, we're presumably average in everything. And if it doesn't work very well, we're out of luck. That is the implicit theory of an IQ test and of the singular word intelligence. The move I made, and I've often said, if I talked about seven talents, nobody would know who I was, was to take the word intelligence and pluralize it. My computer still thinks it's a mistake when I pluralize it, but <laughs> the world is, is more, more forgiving. Um, the issue of, it, of identifying intelligences is what I spent five years doing um, in, a, in a project that spanned the late 70s and early 80s. And I both set up a set of criteria for what counts as an intelligence, and then I um, identified which candidates, so to speak, qualified or didn't qualify as an intelligence. And as you say, Mary, originally I laid out seven, um, but then I added the naturalist. And that was spent, I spent a year studying that. I didn't just say, whoops, there's a natural <laughs> intelligence, whoops, there's a cooking intelligence, whoops, there's a <laughs> computer intelligence. Uh, I don't do that. Um, then I could say I went on to other things, but the more honest answer is, is I didn't want to spend the rest of my life being the intelligence tester or taster. Um, and so, I've speculated that there might be a intelligence for asking big questions, which I call existential, mm -hmm. an intelligence for knowing how to teach different audiences, because we can take two people who have exactly the same knowledge of a subject, and one knows how to teach it to older people, younger people, more informed people, less informed, other person is absolutely curious. <laughs> they just stand on the blackboard and repeat themselves. Mm -hmm. um, but I have not done the necessary research to give the seal of approval to existential or to pedagogical. But to me, uh, if somebody wants to do that, that's great. And if nobody wants to do it, uh, we'll live with that. I think it was the pluralization and the, I guess I would say the, uh, the authorization of what anybody who's a teacher who has a lot of kids knows that kids aren't just either bright or dumb. You know, their kids are very good in school and are disaster outside of school. The kids are very musical, but can't find their way around a, a simple maze. The people have a lot of understanding of other people and no understanding of themselves. And I've given, I've created a vocabulary and a set of, uh, um, I say criteria where people can say, you know, uh, so-and-so, you know, doesn't do very well in school, but has amazing interpersonal or social intelligence. And we should guide that person toward, you know, sales or, 
mm. politics, if you will, or mm. um, therapy. I don't mean taking it, I mean being a therapist because they have you know, enormous understanding of the differences among people. Um, as I said earlier, they may, not, may or may not understand themselves. I call that interpersonal intelligence. And I quip that the only people who can assess your interpersonal, intrapersonal intelligence is your psychiatrist because he or she knows whether you understand yourself or not. And I like to use Ronald Reagan as an, as an example because I think he had lots of understanding of other people. There's no evidence he had any particular understanding of himself and it doesn't matter. That wasn't the business that he was in. We could talk for the next hour about Trump's intelligences, but I <laughs> <laughs> But it is interesting, and I've actually written a blog about this, which will be posted soon, that as soon as in the first the debate, maybe the only debate, um, Joe Biden used the word smart, Trump jumped on him and said, smart, smart, let me tell you about smart. And Trump actually has a real thing about smarts. And mm. anybody with the slightest bit of, uh, of, of psychiatric understanding would know that he's uncertain about his own mm. intelligences. Mm. Um, and that's why he gets, makes such a big deal about how his cabinet has the highest IQs and how he got into very selective schools. But Mary Trump tells us how he got into very selective schools. <laughs> and uh, if he wanted us to know his grades, we would know them. But he has threatened to sue Fordham and Wharton if they reveal mm -hmm. his grades. So I think we, we know he wasn't a very good student. Somebody else certainly sat his SAT for him. But anyway, um, speaking of SATs, and you talked about people students having certain, you know, abilities or bends, a creative bend to, to woodworking or whatever. Do you think that still having the SAT is just a waste of time? I mean, I used to teach the SAT test and I gave up because as soon as they dropped the essay, I thought, this is ridiculous. If they don't want someone who's able to write, why are they going to college? I mean, it's diet became an optional. So do you think we should just throw out all these SAT things? It's just such an arbitrary way of categorizing someone, or do you think they have some value? Well, I have to say, before I answer your question, that your perspective is very British. Um, <laughs> because the ability to write, and for that matter, to speak well, which was something I was not able to do because of my own education, are things which Americans back in the day admired Brits about. Because in fact, uh, to get into a decent university in Britain, you used to have to be able to be, to express yourself orally and in writing. Mm. Um, things have changed everywhere. <laughs> um, and it's probably much less uh, required now it is than it, than it was years ago. Um, the SAT is a, you know, it's an interesting chapter in American history. I probably got to go to Harvard College because I had good SAT scores. Um, despite the fact that I came from Scranton, Pennsylvania, where Joe Biden also comes from. My parents hadn't, hadn't been to college, um, and uh, I didn't have any particular, and I was Jewish, which was not as much of a handicap as it would have been 20 years earlier. So, you know, the SAT was designed as a way, uh, as they used to say, of finding people who um, came from remote and apparently inferior schools. <laughs> the quotation from the, the Harvard <laughs> guidebook. But of course, every, as everybody who's listening to this, watching this knows, uh, you can game the SAT. Um, all four of my kids uh, took the SAT and I certainly didn't hurt them by sitting next to them and telling them, you know, uh, don't come up with the the answer that occurs to you first because that's been put in to seduce you. Uh, mm -hmm. And let's practice some vocabulary words and let's do you know, some quadratic equations. Um, so it can be gained. And the more serious question is, um, who are we admitting to college and what do we want to accomplish there? And I hope in two years I can come back on the Cambridge Forum because Wendy Fishman and I will have published a book called The Once and Future College which is based on 2,000 interviews at 10 different campuses, very disparate from one another, trying to understand American colleges and universities roughly from 2010 through 2018, and um, what the people there think and what we think they should think. Uh, mm. uh, and uh, I think that uh, you know, if you don't bring it up, somebody else is gonna bring up COVID. Um, I have no information about COVID that anybody who uh, scans the media will not have.
But I think that what COVID will do is already doing is helping us to determine what is really essential in professions and in institutions. And as far as I'm concerned, if you go to college and you don't learn to think differently about yourself and about the world, it's a waste of time. Um, it's as simple as that. And so there are all sorts of things which college do, which is very nice, which is give you friends and let you play sports um, and uh, you know, gets, gets you away from home. Uh, um, but that's not a reason for, you know, for spending huge amounts of money in a society. <laughs> And if you're just going, this is the more controversial point, if you're just going to get a job, then the employers should be doing the education. But if you are having a non-vocational school, as hundreds if not thousands of colleges and universities in the United States claim, if they cannot change how you think about yourself and how you think about the world, then it's a waste of money. It's a good point. It's a very good point. I think it's even more of a point now. My daughter's actually just started a master's last week um, at UC San Diego in public health, <laughs> which is, um, you know, all virtual. I, I, I don't know how you do that, all virtual. But anyway, um, this is the new world where, but you're still paying the same fees. <laughs> and, you know, what, for the people who are abroad, including, I think that there's some friends from Colombia, um, mm. the idea of four years which is not vocational, is a very US idea. I mean, most students will go to sometimes better secondary schools uh, in other parts of the world than we have here. And then when they get to be 18 or 19, they're expected to choose their vocation and, and that's fine. Um, England is, is a mixed picture, England, mm -hmm. Scotland, because um, our Ivy League schools were patterned after Cambridge and Oxford and Scotland and, and, and uh, you know, <clears throat> Edinburgh and other uh, Glasgow, Andrew, other yeah. other European, other English British schools, um, and there, while they were vocational, they're soft vocational. I mean, at uh, at Oxford, you can study PPE, right? Politics, yeah, yeah. philosophy, Absolutely. economics. That's not going to prepare you for a single job, but it might change the way you think about the world. And when you were talking earlier about uh, Darwin, and I think unfairly dismissed him as just a biologist. I was going to counter with John Maynard Keynes. Oh, he was just an economist. One of the great synthesizing minds of the 20th century and mm. died very young. Mm. Interesting. Um, just while we're talking about that, uh, about gaining capabilities and maybe losing others, um, uh, I, I was thinking of two things. The people that you held up as being exemplary synthesizing minds in your view, where do we go with these people that don't fit the bill from history? For example, Edison was a really bad student, so bad that his mother had to school him at home. Um, he couldn't sit still in class and he had all sorts of issues. Mozart was almost considered to be, you know, on the autistic spectrum. Um, do you think perhaps that people that have extreme talent really have perhaps some electrical, uh, you know, Oliver Sacks talks about this as well, sort of dysfunction or aberration in their brain that overstimulates a certain section and makes them superb very fast in a particular um, area or capability. It's just, just I was thinking. As I used to say, this is a huge question. <laughs> I know, it's, it's kind of my, my wife, Ellen Winner, who's probably known to some of the people who are with us now, um, studies gifted children. Um, and some children are gifted academically, and they're the ones who get high IQ scores and they're often pushed through school. Mm -hmm. um, but there are other students who are gifted and are very in an island. Um, I mean, the extreme are often autistic youth who might be very good in drawing mm -hmm. uh, or in music, music um, or chess. Um, um, interesting whether they might be precocious in, uh, in the social sphere. I, I, I have, an, have an interest in that. Um, mm. But um, I think this interacts with personality and with child rearing. Um, uh, so, I mean, I think you couldn't go, you couldn't fly from Edison to Elon Musk. I just, you know, there, there, there's so many different, different factors. And, you know, people homeschool their children for very different reasons. Mm. Um, you know, they may think the school is all wet. They may still like the way 
school relates to religion and so on. This is the Amy, the, the, the Tara Westover educated issue or uh, you know, the new Supreme Court nominee also had a very uh, strange kind of, uh, kind of education. Um, so uh, I guess I don't think we can generalize about that except to say, and I think maybe this is what you're hinting at, the more you don't resemble the prototypical good student, which is somebody who's good in language and logic, those are my first two intelligences, the greater the challenge for parents and for the educational system. Summerhill, a school that uh, you will know about, and Sudbury Valley is a local school. You know, this is for kids who really do not fit in the school at all, but somehow there's a feeling if you just leave them alone and don't push them at all, they're gonna find something you're interested in and they're gonna go, going go quite far. But there can be false positives and false negatives. I will tell an MI story, a multiple intelligence story. Um, the group that was most hostile to the theory other than psychometricians, they're people who make their living giving IQ tests so you can understand where they don't like it, are mathematicians. Because mathematicians think there's one way to be smart and that's to be a good mathematician. Until Mary, one of their child, one of their children doesn't do well in school. And then suddenly, oh, bodily <laughs> kinesthetic, social, musical. Uh, so it, it often it holds up a mirror to yourself as well as to your as well as to your children. <laughs> okay, let's go back to human qualities now. Um, because you talked about self-reflection being a form of uh, of uh, self, of intelligence, which indeed it is, emotional intelligence. Um, but Sherry Turkle's written quite a lot about this. In fact, we were discussing this about this new book she's doing on empathy, which I think we are, everyone would say we are losing empathy, uh, the capability of feeling or imagining the thoughts or emotions of another human being. So part of this is to do with technology, of course, and part of it is to do with our lack of community activities, you know, the bowling thing we were talking about, bowling alone. Um, Wade Davis was on here, an anthropologist in the last program, and he was saying that in Canada, unlike America, they still have maintained this sense of community. So is it possible to reacquire, to rewire the brain, do you think, to, to reincorporate empathy and community spirit if it has been lost? Well, you're, you're specializing in, in simple, simple questions, Mary. <laughs> but I'm actually going to try to make an important distinction about multiple intelligences, and I think it will be helpful for our conversation. I think intelligences are ethically and morally neutral. You can be very good in linguistic intelligence. I always use Goethe and Goebbels as examples. Goethe wrote great poetry and drama. Goebbels fomented hatred. Yeah. They were both very good at using the German language, but they used it in very different ways. Mm -hmm. And then my other uh, 20th century pair is Nelson Mandela and Slobodan Milosevic. They both had plenty of interpersonal intelligence. They knew how to touch people. Um, Mandela brought a warring country closer together, at least for a while. Milosevic, uh, ethnic cleansing. You know, let's, uh, you know, let's, let's, let's kill the, uh, the Bosnians. So the intelligences are value neutral. Um, a person can have social intelligence. Uh, well, let's use, uh, let's use Mark Zuckerberg as an example. Uh, I don't know Mark Zuckerberg. Um, obviously, uh, he understands a lot about how to, how to reach other people. Um, if you were a critic, you'd say um, how to manipulate other people. He said community is the most important thing. So he actually tries to use it in, in a positive way. Um, but the important point there is, is that Mark Zuckerberg doesn't lack an understanding of what it takes to get people to communicate with one another, but we could differ viol violently on whether he uses it in a positive or negative mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, I am not a fan of Trump. I, don't, I suspect that nobody who's attending to this broadcast would be. He obviously knows a lot about how to move a crowd. You know, I, I would be happy to borrow his brain in that way. But you know, if we, when he moves them to riot, uh, to be aggressive uh, to people who don't agree with them, that's a very hostile way of using it. You're, you're asking a different question. You're asking the, what Robert Putnam in new book, and we talk about this 
Fishman and I in our book, the, the, the tension between I and we. In our study of, of college students, we interviewed over a thousand students. We looked at how often the word I was used as how often the word we was used. I think you can guess. American college students use I nine times more than they use we. You can do this from big data. And the we is almost always family and close friends. And the dramatic thing is when we ask students about problems on campus, they have no problem to list them. But then we ask them what to do about it. It never says, they don't say very often, well, I want to get together with some of my friends and try to figure out how to do this and then you know, run a campaign or something. So we, as you are implying in Canada, et cetera, we are an incredibly um, singular-minded society. And what Robert Putnam argues in his new book, The Upswing, is this is a dramatic change from the 1960s. Um, however, uh, what he doesn't bring out, but in a this recent discussion with uh, Danielle Allen and other people on Zoom, um, uh, it doesn't bring out that the, the we was typically whites. Um, it didn't include minorities. It didn't include gays. And, you know, it's, it's quite clear that the campaign that Trump and Pence are running is, is to um, have a we, but the we is an exclusionary we, mm -hmm. whereas Black Lives Matter and uh, you know, many other current movements, including the use of pronouns and things like that, is to expand the notion of we. And here's the, here's the point, as uh, somebody now uses all the time. In the history of the world, and this goes back in the prehistory, we were mostly with people who were like us. They looked like us, and they had the same training and so on. Um, it's a new experiment to put people who look together, who look different, who have different sexual orientations, who have different history together, and say, get along. Um, and um, the countries which are the most um, communal at this time in history are the Scandinavian countries, which have the least experience in that. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, in Finland, most people are Finnish and have been Finnish for a long time. Mm -hmm. And Sweden, which is the most uh, open of that countries, has also had the most strain. So, as I say, this is a very big question. There are people who study it all their lives, mm -hmm. but multiple intelligence, I think, is useful in saying the computer is there, but how that computer is used uh, is, is where we have to do a lot of work. And indeed, uh, in the last part of the book, I talk about the work I've done for the last 25 years, which is what we call good work and the good project. And it actually all comes out of multiple intelligences. So let me tell you an anecdote from the synthesizing mind. Um, in 1993, so 10 years after I published my theory, I heard from a, can from a colleague in, in Australia, and the colleague wrote, your ideas are being used in Australia, and you won't like the way they're used. So I said, all right, what's the evidence? So I was sent a lot of materials, and the more I read, the more discouraged and depressed I came. And the worst was a program in one of the six Australian states where they listed all the racial and ethnic groups and which intelligences they had and which ones they lacked. Mm. And I said, my God, this is a total perversion of everything I believe in. Moreover, there's not a shred of evidence for it. But once you give people a, a scheme, this is no different than SAT, people then begin to evaluate everybody in terms of that scheme. So with my close colleagues, William Damon and Mike Csikszentmihalyi, both psychologists, we began something which eventually became the Good Project, and it was a study of how do we make use of human capacities in ways which are positive. And for anybody who is involved in this broadcast, if you just go the good, to thegoodproject.org, very simple, thegoodproject.org, you can learn about our thinking. We've created all kinds of toolkits, good work toolkits, good collaboration toolkits, uh, good play toolkits, to help move the needle in more constructive ways. Before we talk about that, actually, about how we actually develop a, a better synthesizing mind, um, I just wanted to um, ask you about these terms, genius and talent and creativity, because I actually get so tired of them being bandied around willy-nilly. The amount of times people are referred to as geniuses, uh, they've lost all currency, the words. So um, when did, 
you, when do you think, was this the me thing, that average became exemplary? Um, and actually, you talk about three elements, which I'd like you to um, elaborate a bit. You say there's three elements that have to combine for true creativity. Individual combined with the domain, combined with the field. So that really is pretty specific. That wouldn't include all the people that are called geniuses these days. So could you just tell us a little bit about that? How you came up with that? Sure. Um, well, uh, you know, you, we're banding about terms which are widely used. Mm. Um, and Voltaire reminded us that uh, if you want to use such terms, you have to define, your, define them. The MacArthur Foundation announced this week it's geniuses. MacArthur doesn't like that word. It likes the word creative. Um, mm. And that's actually easier, I think, to define than genius. I have a definition of genius, um, which is somebody who sees the world in a way that nobody has seen it before and actually changes the way other people afterwards perceived that world. So when I talk about people like, Di like, like Darwin or Einstein or Leonardo, I mean, I think those are geniuses. I think uh, Mozart was certainly a genius, but it was a genius of a, of a different sort. Um, almost nobody I know, uh, and I know a lot of people who would be called smart, will have changed the way the world thinks about things, and that includes me. Uh, I won't change the way the world thinks about things. I'll maybe have a little change in the sphere. Um, I did a book about cognitive science, and I think Noam Chomsky is probably somebody both in politics and in scholarship who will be read in a hundred years from now, as will Bertrand Russell. Um, so those are people who I would consider to be geniuses of a sort, but you know, it's, it's not, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, and I don't think MacArthur's are geniuses. I want a MacArthur and I don't have any illusion that I'm, I'm a genius. Um, now, um, the insights about creativity actually come from Csikszentmihalyi, whom I mentioned before, a Hungarian American. Um, he wrote Flow, right? That's right. He's I most famous for Flow. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mike, as we call him, did change the conversation about creativity because he said we shouldn't ask who is creative. We shouldn't ask what is creative. We should ask um, where is creativity? And I don't have a, I guess I have a triangle here. Um, you have the individual, you have the domain, which is the area the individual works in, and you have the field, which are people who can make judgments. And to be creative, it's not, I mean, it's not enough for you and your parents to think that you're very original. Um, <laughs> you have to have people who are competent, who can judge whether or not this is original and whether or not it actually makes some kind of an impact. Um, and we might, we might call genius the highest form of creativity. Uh, Chick and Bahai and I talk about big C and little c and middle c creativity. Little c is your child makes a drawing and you put it on a, on a in your refrigerator. It's fine. <laughs> the, the domain and the field aren't affected. The middle c might be uh, a paper that Science Magazine publishes and it maybe does change the way some people carry out the work and then every once in a while a Darwin or an uh, E.O. Wilson comes along and really redefines the field in significant kinds of ways. So I guess um, to make a kind of a meta comment, what, we, what you and I are talking about, Mary, are words that we all bandy about loosely, creativity, genius, mm -hmm. talents or talents. Um, people who do what I do, which is soft social science, try to define these things and come up with at least rough measures of them. And if we're effective, we at least affect the way other people th write about these things and think about these things. If we're very, very effective, we might actually change. I mean, when, when the computer begins to accept intelligence as plural as a word, then we've had some impact. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know what it takes to do, to do that. I just wanted to ask you about one thing that's always fascinated me. I mean, uh, your own experiences are really interesting in the book. So I would say if you get a chance to pick up the book, anybody, it's, and you like memoir, it's fascinating. Um, because, you know, you were kind of a bookish, somewhat solitary kid in some ways, and you explain certain reasons for that, that because of your older brother <clears throat> passing, your parents were overly helicoptery with you and um, lots of elements. 
Um, but I love this idea about introvert, extro extrovert, because that seems to have taken a new kind of, um, people are starting to view this differently now. I remember not too long ago, there was a Newsweek cover story on shyness and how you could help your child be coaxed out of being shy and do all these things he didn't want to do. Um, and now I think we're starting to appreciate the differences between extroverts and introverts um, and the value that they bring. Do you, would you say that's true? This is not something that... Uh, but about yourself, uh, about yourself. Um, but I write far away of something that you may know, but most listeners probably don't know, the work of Anthony Storr, who was a great psychiatrist in England, wrote a book about solitude. Mm -hmm. um, and Storr, whom I knew quite well, believed that, uh, we won't call them geniuses, that you know, highly creative people uh, wanted and needed solitude. And he, he, collapsed, he collected a lot of evidence for that. However, uh, showing that he was a man of his time, like people like me are, they were almost all men. And uh, I think that's a very interesting kind of uh, torque because uh, being an introvert as a woman may be much less accepted, um, right? Uh, and uh, I am an introvert, but uh, somebody uh, once pointed out to me something I've used ever since, it's probably in the book, I'm a compensated introvert which is even though every morning I walk for an hour and I play the piano for an hour and I'm quite happy uh, you know, seeing my family but not having lots of contact with others. So I'm not as bad as somebody who said the pandemic is good for me because it favors introvert. I don't have a great need for, for, for other people, but I'm able to be social because my mother was a very social person. She was a connector. Um, mm. That's the word that... Uh, um, Stanley Milgram, I think, made, made popular. And so I've learned how to do that. And it's a very valuable kind of, uh, it's, a, it's a valuable personality trait to be able to, to, to connect, connect people. Mm. Um, the issue of when is it helpful to be with other people? We talked earlier about how when you've done a synthesis, it doesn't matter if you just think it's good. Other people have to be able to react to it too. That's the field, so to speak. Um, on the, on the other hand, if you'd like to eat a certain way, as long as you don't project it in other people, that's perfectly, that's perfectly fine. Um, the, uh, I wouldn't, I mean, when you brought up introvert, I thought about um, the, there, you know, there's been books about quietness and silence right, and right. solitude and so on. Right, yeah. um, I think those are worthwhile, but I'm gonna be a little bit, little bit professorial here. Uh, these are books where, you know, basically the title sells the book. And if you read the title, you don't have to go too far. And when stuff's been neglected, like the advantages of solitude or quiet or introversion, it's good to bring attention to it. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to correct one thing that you said, because I think it's, it's important for people who are listening to me as a biographical subject. My parents were tremendously helicopter when it comes to my physical well-being, because my brother was killed in a sleigh riding accident in front of my mother my parents had lost everything. And my mother hadn't been pregnant with me, they were gonna kill themselves because they were German Jews who'd expelled from Germany um, and arrived here on Kristallnacht, the night of the broken glass, and they'd lost everything. They were not helicopter parents when it came to my interests. Mm. Um, they let me pursue whatever I wanted. They never told me what to do. Mm. Um, I make a wisecrack, which I don't think is in the book. Uh, when I won a MacArthur Award and I didn't have a job, because I was living off the of grants. I said, finally, my parents can say, my, my son, the genius <laughs> foundation. But um, it's a very important point. And was one you were raising earlier in another context. Um, we should not try to project our own values of intellectual or aesthetic nature onto our children. We should try to project our uh, moral or ethical values, assuming that they're good ones, but we should realize that people, that kids can be bright and talented and interested in different ways. And your obligation as a parent, and now I'm a five-time grandparent, is not to try to make them like you, but to figure out what they're good at uh, and help them get there. If they need to do some things for school, whether it's SAT for my kids or writing essays as it is for my grandson now, fine. But that doesn't mean uh, just because I'm a writer, I should try to make him into a writer. That's very bad. 
Um, that is one of the good notions of the, of the Enlightenment, is, is that we didn't try to make everybody just like us. And uh, you know, it's a real thought line in the world now uh, to think it's, that we should all be one way, whether it's mm. personality-wise or intellect-wise mm. or interest-wise. Um, I'm going to encourage people to put their questions now because um, I don't want to neglect all these wonderful people that are um, involved in watching this from all over the place, actually, including Colombia. Um, but meanwhile, you can tell us how you think we can help develop a synthesizing mind. I mean, do you think it's innate or do you think anyone can nurture no, I, think it, I don't think it's innate in the slightest. And uh, to the extent my book is a how-to book, the last few chapters are what we th I think we can do educationally to help people develop a synthesizing mind. And actually, I think we can do a tremendous amount because it's been invisible. Um, that is, um, I don't think ever in my own education or in that of my children's um, have the notion of synthesizing and what it is and how to do it better um, been explicit. I mean, when you get reactions to a book report or to a, a, a term paper, you know, you may get some feedback which helps you do it, but it's been entirely invisible. And so the, in the book, I quote Murray Gelman, the Nobel laureate in physics, who said in the 21st century, the synthesizing mind is going to be the most important mind. And I think we have actually flunked or failed as a society and probably all over the world in helping people understand what it means to survey things widely, to have a sense of where you want to end up, um, to look at earlier efforts to do this sort of thing. And here's the, again, to quote Mr. Biden, here's the point. There are different ways in which to synthesize using different kinds of intelligence. I, for example, am a taxonomizer. I love to make taxonomies, but you can make, make mental maps, you can make um, equations, you can take, you can do works of art, um, you can have debates, um, you can uh, have, um, uh, you can create three-dimensional architectural architectonics. Um, and all of these are aids to help you put stuff together in ways that make sense to you and will make sense to other people. And until I began to write this book, even though I've known for a long time, I had this kind of mind, um, I didn't realize um, how important the musical and naturalist intelligence were for me. Um, mm. Musical intelligence, because I love music, particularly classical music, though I like jazz and show music. Um, but I think about writing very much like, like a musical composition, you know, with introduction and development and feedback and so on. And even though I don't think anybody would read the book and say it's a symphony, it's how I think. Um, and the, nat and the part of the naturalist intelligence is making categories, making species, testing their limits and so on. And that's what I do all the time. And I've written books about creativity and about leadership and about um, cognitive science. And in each case, um, what I'm doing is putting these pieces together in different ways and saying, does this work for me? Does it work for people whose judgment I trust? And can I put it together in a book? And an important point for any aspiring young people who are listening. I was trained to be a psychologist, which is a scientist, and um, I um, we did experiments like everybody else, and I got them published in peer-reviewed journals. But I realized probably by the age of 30, there were many, many people who could do experiments as well as I could, and lots of people could do it better. But I was a book writer, and books were my natural metier. And when I became interested in the arts or creativity or leadership, I should work in a book, of articles too small. Um, and mm -hmm. so uh, if this book accomplishes anything, it should alert anybody who's involved with their own mind or with the mind of children or students into a latent talent, um, which we can develop and nurture. And at worst, it helps the person make sense of things, but at best it helps other people make sense of things. And uh, um, I think that I could probably point to many relatives that helped me do that and many teachers, but it was a, it was a self-education because nobody ever said, this is how you should go about taking all this stuff and making sense of it. I had to figure it out for myself. A right. um, couple of questions have come in. Um, 
Michael Simon says, perhaps you can elaborate on the intelligence of discernment, i.e. critical thinking. There seems to be so many conspiracy theories or non-truths out there that people believe. How would you rate the American populace in this respect? <laughs> I think that um, we were never very good, and I'm not just talking about the United States, I think people in general, uh, and the good part of, um, of a non democratic society is uh, you know, typically you know, more talented people come to the to, to leadership positions. So you know, a benevolent dictator is the best kind of leader. Um, and Churchill smartly said, democracy is the worst form of government except all the worst one, except every other one. Yeah. So, um, I, I don't think we should romanticize um, the, you know, the, 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 the critical thinking of any population, though the American population of of, of land owning males in the 18th century was incredible. That was probably unique, but you know, they did, didn't consider blacks to be equal, equal human beings. So they had pretty, pretty big, pretty big blind spot. Um, I think that social media has made the job of critical thinking and of truth, which I've written a great deal about, much, much more difficult. Mm. Um, and uh, I think it's going to be a Herculean task to figure out how to make people uh, intelligently discriminating about things that matter. Um, mm. In a book called Truth, Beauty, and Goodness Reframed, which I think is arguably my most important book, um, I talk about the only way to understand truth is to understand the methods which lead people to make the assertions that they do. So whether it's a historian or a psychologist or a politician, when they say something, you have to say, on what evidence did you make that? But this is so much more difficult now, Michael and uh, Mary, because, I mean, you can make a video of Obama, which looks like he's talking and it's not him. Yeah. Um, so I think we're going to end up um, doing two things. One, we're going to find certain people whom we trust, and they can be famous or not, but they're people who are mm. very discriminating and who are willing to admit that they're wrong. And... Um, every morning I scan not only the New York Times and the Washington Post, which I tend to agree with, but the Financial Times mm -hmm. and the Wall Street Journal, and I really agree with the Wall Street Journal, but it gives me a better sense of what the landscape is like. Because you can read after a debate, if you read the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, it's two different debates, even though you watch the same right, film right, your, your right, own kind right. of opinion. So I think it's, it's extraordinarily difficult. Thank you for asking the question, Michael. I would say Either we have to organize our entire educational system around that, and good mm. luck, or we have to find those people whom we trust for their judgment. Um, you know, I always look now at who writes articles in the New York Times. Um, mm. And when Peter, Peter Baker and Maggie Haberman put their head together, I know if they're wrong, they're gonna admit it the next day. Mm. Um, and I have, I have you know, friends who are pundits like Norman Ornstein from American Enterprise Institute, and I, or, or Tom Carruthers from the Carnegie Endowment, um, and they admit when they're wrong about something. Um, but frankly, the bullshit that we find on cable channels across the board, uh, I won't watch it, and I haven't watched it since 2015. When, mm. when my wife puts it on, I walk out of the room. Mm. I, and I also think, I might add, from my own perspective, I think people have to be prepared to pay for good information. They pay for all sorts of things. I mean, subscribe to something like the Atlantic or The Economist or the Washington Post to support it because you can't get good journalism unless you've got the funds to do the investigations. This was proved by the Boston Globe with the Spotlight team. If you don't fund it, it, it it's going to okay. die. So let me ask you this question, Mary. Uh, I agree with you in large part, though I thought that George Soros should simply endow the New York Times in perpetuity. That would have been a better way of doing it. Mm. But, you know, let's say Howard Gardner um, gives a talk like this and is charged for it. You can go to YouTube and you can find hundreds of talks I've given for free. So how do you help people say, well, when I'm with Mary Stack on the Cambridge Forum, it's worth paying five or ten dollars for but when I go to YouTube, I can get it for free. That's a big That's That's dilemma. a big problem. I mean, paying, people aren't used to the idea, not the young generation, of paying for information. They'll pay for all sorts of other rubbish, all sorts of rubbish. Uh, 
you know, all these various channels that they want to have, but they will not pay for information because, you know, most of them are getting it on their phone, unfortunately. And, and you should mention The Guardian because... I used to write for The Guardian. I will mention The Guardian. And the Guardian, <laughs> um, it, 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 uh, when I go to The Guardian, it, it, uh, not, it, it jostles <laughs> me, it nudges me to make a contribution a few times a year. I do. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, you're right. Otherwise, uh, we're only going to have crap. Yeah, we are. Yeah. Sad. But some people want crap. Yeah, because well, unfortunately, uh, didn't confront. We have to raise the bar. Uh, no, uh, somebody else. The bar. Somebody else has got. Rohit Chandra, thank you for your fantastic point about Americans' increasing use of the word "I." We have seen so much entitlement from Americans over the last seven months, such that many of us who are more civic-minded are horrified. Jean Twenge wrote, the narcissism epidemic, but individualism is also an American cultural value. How to separate these two? What can we do to push people back towards we? Well, I agree 100% <laughs> with the sentiment, mm. though I don't interpret the data about social media in the same way that Jean Twenge does. I think it's a more, it's a more complicated uh, picture than she, than she puts forth. Um, but the answer is, there is no shortcut. I'm not religious. Um, uh, you know, God does not play a role in my life. But I think that the world, not just America, but the world is in the need of something which isn't a religion, um, but is like a religion. Uh, I mean, it doesn't have to have God in it. I don't care if it does. I have nothing against God. Um, but we, we need a, um, a, a, a way of thinking which um, is really planetary, because whether it's climate change or nuclear weapons, or even not being dominated by artificial intelligence, this is not gonna happen just because China wants it or because the United States wants it or because India wants it. Um, it's only gonna be happened if there is a real, a real consensus. And consensuses have to be led they don't come with all the wonderful things about coming up from the ground in Arab Springs and so on. There need to be leaders. I don't know where the questioner comes from. I always say that Gandhi was the most important person of the last thousand years. I don't say more than a thousand because I don't want to step on Christ or Buddha or Muhammad. But uh, uh, Gandhi understood that if we didn't get along, the, the, the planet would vanish. And if we tried to do it through violence, that was terrible. And I imagine many people who are listening to this are horrified by what happened in Michigan just in the last day or so, where we discovered that people actually wanted to take over, kidnap yeah. the governor and take over the, uh, um, the, the, the state house and the administrative positions. Uh, um, uh, you know, now it's Martin Luther King understood Gandhi and he, he paid for it with his life. Um, you probably haven't tuned in this to hear me wax, wax philosophic or religious, but there, I guess the answer to Rowett's question is, is there no quick, there's no quick fix to get away from selfishness. Um, and we each who think that's bad need to do our part. I try to model reasonable behavior. And um, the Good Project is an effort to get uh, individuals to think about ethical issues. Mm -hmm. um, in our study of higher education, we found that almost no students knew what ethics was, except for cheating, they didn't know what an ethical dilemma was. And when we asked them, who do you turn to um, on campus for an ethical dilemma, they had no idea. So it's not even on the radar screen of American college students. And these aren't bad people. Uh, I don't like the notion of bad people at all. But these are individuals who have not been raised in a society where other things matter. Um, with my grandchildren the other day, I, I went through the Ten Commandments on I and we. Um, uh, and uh, um, you know, I think that, uh, that uh, you, know, you know, you know, believing that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, I think is too big a stretch. But understanding the values of our great religious leaders, whether it's Jesus mm -hmm. or Gandhi or uh, Moses, uh, um, and again, they weren't working alone. Uh, I think that would be the American myth. Uh, uh, there's a great wisecrack about Gandhi by one of his associates who said it costs a lot of money to keep Gandhi in, po in poverty. Um, uh, and um, I've written extensively about this. All the great leaders are dependent upon the media for communication. Moses wasn't a good talker. He used Aaron. 
Gandhi needed the telegraph because when Gandhi went on strike, hunger strike, if the rest of the world didn't know and get upset, he would have just died. Mm. And indeed, with mm. the, uh, I mean, Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt with the radio, Hitler with the radio, um, uh, John Kennedy with television, and mm. uh, Trump, who I think made clear I have no use for. Twitter. Uh, Trump is, is inconceivable without The Apprentice, yeah. which is how he learned these big rallies, and Twitter. Yeah, he wouldn't, he ideas wouldn't out make a speech to save his life. And here we are in an old-fashioned media, Mary, talking uh, <laughs> intellectually, uh, but admittedly by Zoom, that's new, but radio and so on. Uh, we, have right. to do what we, we, we have to do what we think is right, and we have to model it. And when people are willing to listen, we have to explain why we do what we do. That's my answer to uh, Michael and Rowett. So Rosario, who I think you know, Jaramillo, has said, you're going back to the original sin of selfishness. You forgot Fox News. <laughs> yes, so. I, I didn't single out Fox, though it's probably the worst. It is. But, yeah. um, you know, MSNBC, Yaleel's in the other direction. And as you all know, there are all kinds of websites, which I don't, the names of which I don't even know, which just spew hatred. Mm. Uh, mm. And, and so, uh, you know, Fox and, and MSNBC at least have the semblance of bringing in different points of view, but the, the kind of uh, QAnon kinds of sites, which just like, spew hatred. Yeah, like uh, the other ones, which send people to Michigan to try to, to try to kidnap the governor. Well, you brought us to a very good segue there, Helmut, because um, I'm actually going to be closing shortly and um, Next, our next program is going to be about trust and polarization. And um, that, that's one of the things that Pew um, has recently found that not only is our trust in institutions at an all time low, but that distrust or mistrust is now evolving or descending into hatred, which is new. I mean, we haven't had that happening here not on this scale. So um, we're, we've got a couple of minutes left. I don't see any new questions coming in, in the chat room here. Um, somebody's put something here I don't quite understand. Somebody said, loving the conversation. Uh, Rosario said, you need innate blocks to assemble equals synthesize, symphony is a sound synthesis. I think she's being playing full with words there. Is she a poet? <laughs> So certain, thanks, Rosaria. Um, alliterative, and she has a beautiful name. Yeah, she does. She belongs to a wonderful group that I, I do know in, 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 Colo in Colombia. It's wonderful. Well, very glad you're joining us from Colombia today. That's wonderful. Um, we've just posted some wonderful photographs of Colombia on the website, by the way, because Wade Davis last week has just published a book on Colombia, and he let us use some of the photographs for you to enjoy. They're magnificent on the website. Okay, well, uh, I've really, really enjoyed this today. It was just so, so interesting and it's so vast, the, the subject, but you really did make it understandable to everyone, which I thank you for, Howard. It was really very clear and comprehensible. So I'd like to thank everybody, Howard included, for listening to today's Cambridge Forum uh, with original thinker, author of A Synthesizing Mind, a memoir, and Hobbes Research Professor of Cognition and Education at Harvard, Howard Gardner. <laughs>